Assalamu alaikum. My name is Brother Ijaz, and today I'm actually joined with Brother Hassan Ozaman Shamal. He is a PhD student and a graduate research assistant at uh, the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he's originally from Bangladesh. He is a practicing Muslim. And you can probably tell that because his beard is definitely longer than mine's. Brother Hassan, assalamu alaikum. It's good to see you and hear from you again. Can you please introduce yourself? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. By the way, I grew out this beard for this live stream specifically, so I don't know if that counts. <laughs> um, alhamdulillah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, well, as, as far as educational background goes, uh, I, I go by uh, Hassan, by the way. As far as educational background, I did my honors and masters in microbiology, which is basically the discipline where you study bacteria, viruses, and stuff like that. And my master's thesis was on virology, which is the study of viruses, although not this specific virus. Um, so my honors and masters was from Bangladesh. I came to the States last August to start my PhD. Um, I have also been working as a public health researcher for two and a half years back in Bangladesh. And I wasn't working with viruses specifically, but I was working with how bacteria spread um, through food and water. So right now I'm in my PhD, I'm doing, um, my, my PhD is in the cell and molecular biology program. And I'm basically working on um, how living things change, how bacteria and bacteria and viruses change, how they grow, um, that sort of stuff, very generally speaking. Perfect. So, Brother Hassan, as you would know, uh, COVID-19 uh, has become officially a pandemic. Lots of countries are actually going into lockdown. Mm -hmm. And the response has been largely good from the Muslim community internationally. But still, a lot of people don't understand the risk and the significance behind this specific virus. If it is possible, can you let us know what makes COVID-19 this dangerous? Why is it so much of a problem for the world today? Right, so that's a great question. And that's, that's exactly the right way to frame this. Like what is unique about COVID-19? What is unique about the official name of the virus is sars coronavirus 2 um, I don't think that's a very catchy name. It hasn't really stuck. Many scientists have criticized it, but anyways. So this particular virus, why is it so dangerous? I mean, like we had epidemics before, right? We had pandemics before. And every few years due to media, we come across these health scares and these kind of epidemic scares. And at one point people kind of, kind of get kind of inured to that, that sort of thing. People begin to think, yeah, it's like one more of those things that we heard in the media before. So the exact right way to frame this discussion is what's new about this, this thing that we're facing right now. So basically the one line summary of what would, be our entire conversation, I hope, is COVID-19 is something that we've never seen before. Um, uh, it's completely unique, it's completely unprecedented, and I'd, I'll, tr I'll be trying to kind of explain why that is, kind of like list the two or three reasons why that is. Um, and it's something that we haven't seen in, in recent history, something like it. Uh, definitely not in our lifetimes, definitely not in our parents' lifetimes. Um, the last pandemic that really comes close to um, in terms of how dangerous it is was the 1918 Spanish flu. That's really the appropriate comparison that you want to draw, want to draw with the COVID-19. So um, I'll kind of be briefly outlining some of the key sticking points as to why this is such a dangerous thing. Um, the first thing is this virus is airborne. Um, so for example, um, and in the course of this conversation, I'm, I'm going to bring up some of the recent health scares that we saw to kind of like compare to show how mm -hmm. this is unique. So very recently, we had the Zika virus epidemic, right, that started from Brazil, and there was a scare about it and whatnot. Now, Zika was carried by mosquitoes, and you can avoid mosquitoes, but COVID-19, this disease, and the SARS coronavirus, this is carried by air. Like airborne transmission is one of the ways in this virus spreads. Um, we know for a fact that viruses, like this particular virus, as viruses like this, mm -hmm. they can like stay afloat in the air and they can be active in that way for hours on end. 
like a recent paper that came out actually demonstrated with very like rigorous evidence that the uh, SARS coronavirus 2 can actually float and stay active in the air for three hours. And we don't really know what the significance of that is. And that's really one of the problems of this whole thing. We, we, we can deal with a known danger, but a lot of this is unknown. And we kind of have to um, measure the risks, risks and benefits. So we don't really know what the significance uh, in quantitative terms of this airborne transmission, but we do know that it happens. Mm -hmm. And we do know that this has led to serious consequences in the case of other respiratory viruses, other viruses that basically affect your lung and your airways. So for example, we know in the case of influenza, it's airborne. It can float in the air and it can attack people. Um, this is SARS coronavirus 2, right? In the case of SARS coronavirus 1, one of the biggest issues were, was basically that it, it, it was airborne. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really difficult to control something that literally floats in the air, right? So probably to kind of curb mass panic or hysteria, CDC, WHO, these organizations, they have been emphasizing on keeping your, keeping your hands clean and not being um, within six feet of like other people. Mm -hmm. But you could make an argument that that's not enough because this virus can float in the air and it can probably travel greater distances than just six feet and stay active. So that's one of the ways in which this virus is different from Zika, it's different from Ebola, it's different from AIDS because it's not easy to get, get AIDS. Uh, it's very easy to get uh, COVID-19. So that's like, that's one of the first layers of complexity uh, and challenge that this virus uh, presents. So, yeah. Yep. So thank you for that really comprehensive answer. And so it makes sense now why so many Muslim countries, especially Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Kuwait, Qatar, even here in Canada, the Canadian Council of Imams issued a statement, we need to suspend not just the Friday prayer, but the congregational prayer throughout the day. So I guess it's because they understand the significance and the risk of this virus. So for the people that are still going to, for Friday prayers, some of them think that it's actually safer to hold it in their homes as an alternative to going to the masjid, but that does not mitigate the risk. In fact, you're in a smaller, more enclosed space, someone coughs or someone sneezes. It just, it makes it worse, actually. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, you're saying something? Yeah, so I wanted to ask then, uh, if someone sneezes on like carpet or they you know, sneeze and then they put their face on the floor, is that not a good way to potentially get this virus to be infected by it? Yeah, exactly. So um, I'm not really um, a religious scholar. I don't really have any sort of academic training in religion at all. I can only speak to you about what the scientific and health risks are and mm -hmm. kind of leave the religious op uh, opinion or deliberation to more qualified people. Indeed. Um, yeah, so the way you framed that question was in terms of coughs and sneezes and carpets being contaminated. But um, this virus can spread when you talk. This virus can spread even when you breathe. Like um, in the case of influenza, which is uh, kind of a similar virus in that it's also airborne and it's a respiratory virus that attacks your airways and lungs. Like researchers were able to detect active viral particles in the air that the infected people breathe. So it's not really enough to just talk about coughs and sneezes. You'd also have to talk about, like you can't tell people to stop breathing, right? Stop breathing within six feet of, that's, that's just like, that's not feasible. Uh, that's not possible even. So yeah, that's, that's kind of another layer and uh, layer of unprecedented uh, that the COVID-19 is presenting. So one particular way I want to frame this issue is um, like, and this is, this is really something, uh, this has become something of conventional wisdom or received wisdom, especially in social media and such, that people keep saying that if you are sick, stay at home, don't associate with people. But if you are not sick, well, then you don't really have to be that careful. And to an extent that makes sense, right? Because that's how usually we think about disease because we think disease spreads when you're sick. That's why when we visit, for example, a diseased relative at the hospital, um, we come home and we kind of wash ourselves because we associate hospitalization as kind of like a focus of uh, spread of disease and infection. Yes. Well, you can't say that in the case of COVID-19 and that's unlike 
really anything we've seen before. That's unlike, um, again, Zika and Ebola, and that's unlike SARS-CoV-1. Um, this SARS-CoV-2 is absolutely unprecedented in recent history in that you don't need to be visibly or obviously sick in order to spread the disease. So um, like you don't immediately get sick after the virus infects you, right? Um, the virus takes a few days to kind of establish itself in your lungs, in your, uh, in your lungs mostly, before you get a fever, some cough or other symptoms, you may not have any symptoms. But if, if you do end up developing symptoms, it, it would take a few days to get to that point. Now in that pre-symptomatic phase where you don't really have any symptoms, but you're st still carrying the virus, mm -hmm. you can absolutely spread the virus. Like there is no, um, there is um, no disagreement in the scientific community uh, about, that, about that issue. So that distinction in the case of COVID-19 is absolutely meaningless, that if you are sick, you can stay at home. If not, maybe you can be a little lax. That does not apply. And that's, again, one of the, one of the ways in which COVID-19 is completely different. So just to put some numbers on this, um, recently there's been this really big paper in the journal Science, which is one of the most reputable and respectable scientific journals. And mm -hmm. what the researchers did, and they, they studied like 375 Chinese cities to kind of study how this disease spreads, right? And the conclusion that they came to is 79% of the disease, 79% of the disease was caused by people who had no symptoms. Wow. So, yeah, so you- That's have... almost eight in 10 of every person that has Exactly, disease. exactly. So, yeah, so- I mean, that's, that, that really forces us to kind of change our way of thinking about disease and disease spread, right? Um, like anyone could be infected without testing, even with testing in some cases, and that's a whole other caveat there. It's impossible to say whether you're carrying coronavirus uh, or this specific strain of coronavirus. So like, we don't really know who's sick. We don't really know who's infected. Uh, and just to add another statistic, it's not just in China. People might think China is kind of a different place. Uh, same studies have been carried out in other cities in China. Same studies have been carried out in Singapore. And um, I'm originally from Bangladesh. So one thing is Singapore, the climate of Singapore is kind of similar to Bangladesh. And that's kind of significant um, in my way of thinking because I'm always, th I'm always thinking about back home. So they did the same study in Singapore and they found basically the same thing. You can't stop the spread of this virus by just isolating diseased people. That doesn't make sense in the context of this disease. You'd need to isolate normal people as well. You need to isolate everyone if you actually want to stop the spread of this disease. So that's another way in which this disease is unlike anything we've ever seen before. So there's also this misconception that only older people get the disease and that younger people can't. Is that perception correct? Um, not only th is that, like that perception is what I would call partially true. And I think that's what's most damaging, like truth and falsehood, they're kind of like easy to see and whatnot. But in, in the case of partial truths, it's kind of difficult to entangle. And in many cases they have more potential to cause damage. So. As it happens, um, if you do get the virus, if you're an older person or if you're immunocompromised, if you have hypertension, diabetes, all of that, you do have like, you are in a like greater risk of developing more severe symptoms. That's, that's true. But where there's no difference in the pro is in the probability of catching the virus. So it doesn't help you if you are like a perfectly fit individual, if you're in your 20s, 30s, whatever, you have equal probability as an 80 year old to catch the virus. Like your body or immune system doesn't really protect you from like getting exposed to the virus. That's not something that happens. So um, to kind of put this in perspective, if you are a young person, it is true that you have less of a risk in developing, dying basically, you have less of a risk uh, of developing severe symptom. Uh, you have less of a risk of uh, being hospitalized but you have, some would say more of a risk of spreading this virus around. So in the case of other diseases, like, um, uh, like people studied kind of resp respiratory virus spread um, in the case of other viruses and other diseases, and they found like the people who spread the viruses the most are children. So mm -hmm. we kind of associate children with, you know, um, 
or at least young adults as having like good immunity and they yes. um, will probably not be uh, infected. That's true, but you are also the person who is uh, who's, who, who, who will be most prone to harm others. And some would say probably maybe from an ethical religious perspective, that's even uh, like that's, that, that should weigh more heavily on your conscience. Like what would you choose? Harming yourself or harming a loved one? Harming others, harming like elderly people at the masjid. So yeah, to answer your question, you are just as likely, if not more likely to spread the virus if you're a young person, but it is true that you have less of a chance of developing severe symptoms yourself. But nonetheless, you still develop symptoms one yeah, way or the yeah. other. Yeah, I, I, I think that's way, being lost. One tiny clarification, one mm -hmm. tiny clarification that I would wanna make is, um, one term that's often thrown around is mild, mild um, COVID-19. And people kind of misunderstand that. If people think mild COVID-19 means just a common cold or something. Mm -hmm. Mild COVID-19 is essentially having the flu. So it's, it's like it says like the term is mild compared to like acute respiratory distress or death, but it's not mild in terms of the effect that it's going to have on you. You'll still have the flu and you'll be still for like out for weeks or whatnot. And that's what's scary, right? So what we think might be maybe some runny nose or a cough here and there can actually develop into a full-blown flu and you don't expect it. I mean, I've been seeing videos of people on Facebook in the hospital saying, I was fit, I was healthy, I didn't think that I would get this virus. I got it and you hear their breathing and it sounds worse than that Vader. You know that yeah. they can't breathe properly and that yeah. is really scary. Yeah, but yeah. not just that, I also have to ask, um, so the scientists and the doctors have been telling us, wash our hands. Mm -hmm. Why is it that we need to wash our hands thoroughly? Not just run it under the water, not just you know, dunk your hand in a bucket. You actually need to scrub quite diligently. What is the reasoning behind that? Yeah, so that's really, that's one of the main pieces of advice that's been going around and by far it's the most important. So there are several ways in which you can catch the virus. And like the most obvious way is what, would, what we would call is contact. So let's say I'm using this laptop to talk to you. Let's say mm -hmm. this laptop was with someone else, someone who had um, um, the virus, maybe not the disease itself, but the virus. And let's say he's been breathing on top of this laptop. That's impossible to avoid, right? And he's been de depositing like virus particles on the touchpad and the key keyboard and whatnot. And let's say I get the keyboard and I use it, I use the touchpad, the key, uh, keyboard and whatnot. And then I kind of touch my eyes or my nose or my mouth and the virus, that's a very easy way for virus to get in, the, uh, get in your system. That of course mm -hmm. applies all the more uh, in the, if you are, for example, commuting on a bus and if you're holding one of the subway bus poles, um, if you're, you gave the example of the masjid, that's definitely part of it. Um, like you, know, you would probably have like deposition of viruses on the prayer mats and whatnot, and you can very likely catch the virus from there. So that's one of the reasons why one of the main health interventions that's been that like people have been trying to hammer home is wash your hands as much as possible. And I think um, a very instructive story in this regard is something that happens in the case of the SARS coronavirus one. So in the case of SARS coronavirus one. Um, by the way, one of the reasons that disease was kind of easier to control was only the hospitalized and sick people were spreading this disease. So we mm -hmm. knew uh, who to quarantine and who to isolate. So one of the schools in Beijing uh, during SARS coronavirus one outbreak were, was actually kept open. It wasn't closed. But what, what the teachers did is they had this strict policy of having all the kids wash their hands regularly. And they had this song that they would have these kids sing so they're not running their hands under the water. They're actually like spending a lot of um, time That's under trouble. the water. So as it happened, after the outbreak went, outbreak went away, for months on end, none of the kids in that school had any sickness, not just the coronavirus, but any sickness. There wasn't any other respiratory illnesses, no stomach bugs, nothing. Like attendance were, was perfect for months on end. So that story kind of demonstrates like the power this sort of simple activity would have. And it's also, uh, of course, important to note, as you point out, like 
the viruses are tiny. They're like one two thousandths of a millimeter, right? So it's not really easy to kind of comprehend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's 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 not easy to kind of move move them away from your hand just by running your hands under the water. You have to kind of scrub it with soap and whatnot to get all of the viruses out. Um, yeah, so I could I could actually say a lot more on this topic, but I think that's kind of the overall summary of why it's important. So a lot of people had the idea that, uh, you know, if I do voodoo five times a day, I'm not going to get the disease. But if you don't scrub your hands with soap and water, what happens is you just put the virus all over your face. You breathe in the virus, you rinse the virus, you gargle the virus, you do all the wrong things. And this is partly why a lot of the massage have stopped allowing people to do wudu at their places of worship because they wanted to stop that. Mm -hmm. And I also noticed, I had a discussion uh, last week with um, a, a friend from the Catholic community. He actually says that they stopped that uh, basin in which they have uh, holy water as you enter the church. You dip your hand in it and you do the sign of the cross. He mm -hmm. said, no, very quickly they realized that also was a potential way to spread the virus very quickly. Yeah. Now, similarly to this, when you go into many masajid, you would find many copies of the Quran that they would have the community use. Those copies of the Quran, those books, also need to be cleaned. Absolutely. Because why now? Everyone has touched them. And mm. that is also a means of spreading the virus. Yeah. Uh, if I may comment on the religious aspect of it just for a minute or so, we need to keep in mind, and I just realized I've just touched my nose, but my hands are clean. I just scrubbed them just before I came on. But having said that, a lot of people are still concerned. Well, why did we suspend the prayer? Why did we suspend Friday prayer, most importantly? And how will this affect Ramadan? We have to remember that one of the central aims of Islam is the preservation of life. Now, yes, you can still fast, most likely, although I think there might be some religious opinions indicating that if you're going to have a weakness of the immune system, it may not be right for you in this case to fast because you might invite uh, getting the virus and becoming ill in that case. But that's for the scholars to hash out. For us, we need to consider that being spiritually prepared is in obeying the medical advice that is circulating. You are not some magical superhero that is invincible from viruses and from illness. Allah tells us in the Quran, do you think other people will be left to say, we believe and they will not be tested? So yes, you can have all the belief in the world. It does not mean that your belief will protect you from getting this virus. And so you need to take the precautions. Yes, uh, read your dhikr, make dua, perform your salah, but keep in mind that you are, are an individual that is always susceptible to this virus and we must submit to the uh, health authorities and their advice. Now, Brother Hassan, I do need to ask, for example, uh, people, uh, they tend to stroke their beards a lot as well. As Muslims, we tend to do that. In that case, washing your hands and washing the beard, would that also not be a recommendation at this point in time? Absolutely. And that applies all the more to me because not only do I have the problem of like scratching my beard, but also putting it in my mouth. I don't know if okay. I had this awful habit. I don't know when I picked it up, but it's what it's this virus has been kind of one of the wake up calls of kind of like stop doing that and whatnot. So yeah, definitely. So uh, and uh, going back to the wudu point, because that kind of ties into it. Um, just water wouldn't be enough to kill the virus. Like you're not, like we need to understand what the point of washing is, right? Um, you can't remove the virus from your hand with water, no matter how much force you put into it. What you have to do is you have to inactivate the virus. You have to kill the virus. And for that, you need the special chemicals that are in the hand sanitizer or the soap to interact with the virus particles and inactivate it. So you would absolutely need to use soap and wudu alone wouldn't really have any effect. Um, if, if, it, if it was like a larger particle, maybe it would have removed, but in the case of virus, it wouldn't really have any effect. Um, so definitely in the case of any, any place that your hands touch, 
whether it be the beers, whether it be your laptop, anything that your hands touch frequently, it's absolutely recommended that you keep them clean. In the case of beard, you could just use soap or whatever. But in the case of your laptop or your, um, I don't know, your kitchen counter and whatnot, uh, it's actually recommended that you use some sort of a disinfectant with a high amount of alcohol. So at least 60% alcohol, I believe, is the WHO recommendation. And to be clear, this form of alcohol is not haram. In fact, uh, uh, hand sanitizers specifically, uh, they dissipate at least, uh, so they don't stay on the hand. It actually dissipates as time goes on. Yeah. So it's it's absolutely permissible to wipe your hands with hand sanitizer and then consume something or perform would do it does not make you an alcoholic nor does it make you a person who you know consumes alcohol on any level uh, in addition to that i do need to ask you uh, some people would be using the same prayer mat the same janamas as we might say mm. what would be the advice for those people should they wash it should they get like a lysol spray what should be done to that because their face will be touching it what is the advice we can give such people yeah, definitely. And that's, uh, it's kind of like a super context specific thing that's kind of for each of the massages and like houses or whatever to figure out. But generally the idea is again, not to just wash with water, but also wash with soap or um, alcohol containing disinfectant, bleach and whatnot um, to kind of really clean and make sure that all of the surfaces are completely clean. Uh, and remove from uh, remove from viruses. I'm sorry, I almost said bacteria because I'm a bacteriologist first and foremost. Um, you know, uh, in in many cases that would kind of be difficult to maintain. So the general idea is kind of to stop people from congregating in the same places and to stop people from touching the same things because it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't really be feasible unless uh, unless you have like a massive operation going on to clean the prayer mat, what, in every 10 minutes after someone prays? Possible. Do that. It, it's not really feasible. Yeah. So yeah, the general idea should be just to stop people from touching the same things. Well, one of the most common devices that we all own are cell phones. Mm -hmm. And we put that on our face and we breathe into the mouthpiece. That could potentially be one of the things that can infect you. Yeah. So we're asking people, even those devices, you clean, you wipe, and most importantly, you do not share them. Exactly. Don't let your friends play games on them. Yeah. Don't borrow your friend's phone to make a phone call because that can be one of the ways in which you spread the disease. Now, Definitely. Brother Hassan, thank you very much for joining me today. Is there any last part and advice that you would like to give to the community at large? Yeah, um, so there's this one last thing that I want to say, and it's again to hammer home the theme of how unprecedented this disease is. Mm -hmm. um, we are kind of wired to look for signs of danger before we react, right? That's, that's just in our DNA as human beings. The problem with COVID-19 is you don't really have that opportunity because by studying the disease spread in every other country, every other country except the ones that, uh, that have handled it well, like Taiwan, uh, in Italy, in France, in the USA, actually, what you see is before you see this eruption of disease cases, you actually see this slow buildup, actually not that mm -hmm. slow buildup of invisible cases that leads to this eruption and explosion of disease cases later. So before you have obvious cases, obvious signs of danger, you have this completely invisible signs of danger that you can't detect. So it's really, it, it requires us to change the way we think. So just a couple of examples in China, when there were a hundred, just a hundred reported cases, there were at least 1500 undetected cases going around um, in Washington, which is the first state in the US to get infected. When there were literally zero reported cases, um, the researchers studied the RNA of the circulating virus and they found out that there were at least somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 in, uh, in, um, invisible cases that were going around. So we need to, just because the case number is low, that's not really, that doesn't really give us any permission to be lax. We really need to think about like the explosion that's coming and the high buildup of cases that's coming. And one of the things that I did um, in preparation for live stream was kind of look at how Canada ha handled the SARS-1 Mm -hmm. um, disease, right? The first SARS disease. And one of the surprising things that I found is 
um, the disease kept going away, like it was kind of plateauing and people were kind of breathing a sign of a sigh of relief and getting back to their um, activities. But then it can, kind of came back and this happened in Toronto. Like, um, oh. yeah, so this is the, this is the place where uh, like people kind of stopped distancing themselves and stopped isolation and these preventive, preventive measures. And then, then it came back as a, with a vengeance. So we absolutely given like the strain this would cause on our healthcare system, the strain that this was uh, this would cause on care of elderlies and like especially like the immunocompromised among us, we absolutely need to be on our toes and make sure not only that we don't get infected, but we are not the cause of infection for other people. Indeed. Jazakallah Hukairan for your participation, Brother Hassan. I want to thank you for coming here today. And I do advise that everyone else heed his advice. Uh, make sure that you follow up on the news and listen to your healthcare professionals. This is not something that you should take as a joke, not something that you should be willing to risk your life for. So please heed his advice. Brother Hassan, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.